Welcome to another episode of Wealth Uncensored. I'm joined today by international tax CPA, Ali Khan of Abitos, who's based in Florida, one of the very few U.S. tax professionals that I know that actually knows what they're doing when it comes to preparing U.S. tax returns that have an international component to it. So for people with foreign income or assets. Jenny, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, and, and thank you for having me on your podcast. You know, as you know, I used to own a tax preparation business. So you're in the tax advisory tax preparation business. One of the things that I've noticed in the market for when you're looking for an international tax professional is it's really difficult to tell the difference between those that know what they're doing and those that don't, right? I mean, if you're trying to find somebody online, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that where the company name itself indicates that this is what these dudes do, right? Like this is what they're they're good at. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast. Straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. Um. And, you know, I mean, they do tremendous marketing, a lot of these guys, right? Like they're pumping out blogs every week. They're pumping out, pumping out videos every week. But then when you get into the actual work product that these guys produce, it's not very good. Let's put it that way. A lot of times what, what I've seen is a lot of the guys that, you know, really know what they're doing, you know, they don't have this level of marketing because they're busy doing what they're good at. And so I wanted to talk a little bit today about what your thoughts are on this what kind of you know what's the sort of telltale sign that if you look if you're sort of evaluating new preparers like that you can tell this guy knows what he's doing or doesn't know what he's doing yeah it's uh you know it it's certainly tough because as you said the, these guys they're they're great marketers they write a lot of articles they write a lot they, they make a lot of videos and normally they're spearheaded by somebody that uh does have some experience may know what they're doing but a lot of this work is outsourced. You know, it's being prepared all over the world. There's not really much quality control of the work. And when you look at somebody that's charging, you know, five hundred dollars for a return that we would be at, you know, twenty five hundred to three thousand, there's only one way they're doing it. It's volume based. And you and I see a lot of these issues. We we fix a lot of these issues. It it it's tough for taxpayers to know when they're looking at somebody's website, I, you know, I think having an initial call with some of these people and not just the main individual, not just the one partner, but maybe the compliance team, you know, I, it would be worthwhile speaking with who's working on your file, you know, who's the manager that's reviewing this work, not just a partner that's signing off on it. If it ever gets to that stage, um, you know, we, we we see so many situations where even though they advertise that they do Australian work, that they don't know how to treat a superannuation. You know, New Zealand has a Kiwi saver. They they really don't know what that's about. You know, a lot of times they take, well, it looks like Social Security, it, uh, so we'll just go that way. But there's so many penalties associated with this type of work that... You have to be careful. And at the end of the day, you as a taxpayer, you're responsible. You're the one signing on the dotted line. I remember I was interviewing for, for tax managers one time. And I interviewed this this individual who had worked for one of these big, low-cost international tax preparation firms. And they told me that in the prior tax year, they had reviewed and signed off on a 1,000 tax returns. How is that possible that you could have reviewed a thousand tax returns? I mean, unless you, what you count as review is having seen it and signed it. I mean, there's right. just no way that you can have reviewed a thousand tax returns. No, no, it's certainly not possible. I mean, if, if you know, if you think about there's um, 2,000 hours in the year that you would expect somebody to work, not including holidays and vacations. 
you're basically saying that this person is 100% productive and 100% of their time has been spent on reviewing returns. And then if that, they're, they're signing off and reviewing by spending two hours on a complicated return. You know, yeah. a lot of times, um, expats don't really feel that their tax returns are complicated. They're, yeah. you know, even the simplest returns are complex. It's not your simple W-2, you know, it's not a tax slip that's being reported. Every aspect of it re- requires some sort of international expertise, even if it's as simple as a foreign tax credit, foreign earned income exclusion, or an FBAR reporting or a Form 8938. You really have to know what you're doing. You know, you have to pay attention to the detail here. Um, this is specialized work. It's not so much just run of the mill um, comparing tax slips and moving on. You're, you're 100 percent right. Yeah, I think one of the most common forms that probably has to get filled out when it comes to to international taxes is a 2555 to to for the the foreign earned income exclusion, right? Right. And I, I just had this issue where I was talking to to a client not that long ago, and they were talking about the physical presence test, and they're like, "Yeah, well, you know, I have to be out of the U.S. for 330 days." And I said, "No, no, you don't have to be out of the U.S. for 330 days. You need to be physically present in a foreign country for 330 days. You're on a cruise in international waters. You're not present in a foreign country. It doesn't count. I think there's a lot of these sort of nuanced stuff that, I mean, this stuff isn't even taught to you in school. This is stuff that you have to learn through experience. I mean, I mean, how many years have you been doing this? About 13 years now. And, and you're right. When I, when I came out of school, um, even getting my CPA license, International is not touched on. I, I think I recall one question on the CPA exam that dealt with the F bar, and, and at that time, of course, I had no idea what it was. But you know, you have to you have to really do this at a high level for a number of years to get some sort of an understanding. You really need somebody that's been doing this for seven, eight years at least, um, where, where they have a good foundation and can guide you through whatever may come up. You know, things have gotten fairly more challenging since 2017, right? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. What may have been a, a somewhat complex form in the 5471 is now a, a total monster. Um, you know, I don't know how many I've seen that have been completed correctly. I think this is a great, great example, right? Because I mean, it's 5471 is an ungodly complex form. I mean, yeah. and, and it's one of those forms. There's a lot of forms where fill in numbers and sort of spits out an end result, right? Like, you know, you fill out the form and say, right. okay, this is how much tax you owe. The problem with the 5471 is you need to know how to do certain calculations in order to even put the numbers in the form. I've seen some of what some of these people have paid on these great international tax marketing companies. And, you know, some of them advertise like a 5471 for 500 bucks. You know, we really budget four to eight hours on each 5471 that we prepare because it, it requires time and effort. A lot of times you're not getting financials that are gapped. So before you even get to the form, you have to make those adjustments to get the gap financials. And then there's all these schedules we have now on the 5471 where you're tracking earnings and profit, what's been taxed, what bucket it goes into, whether it's guilty so part of transition tax. So it's certainly not easy. Software doesn't assist. You know, you have to have good work papers. In order to have good work papers, it, it takes time to complete those work papers, right? Uh, so $500 for 5471, I don't think exists in today's world. And firms that do offer it, you know, I don't think they complete all those schedules. We've seen it, you know, we've seen it on in, in several cases. You know, if you're a lawyer or a CPA or, or, or even an EA that has extensive experience in, in international tax, right, you're probably not charging less than 500 bucks an hour. There's just no way that somebody that really knows what they're doing is going to be able to do a 5471 for 500 bucks. And, and you know what the other thing is when we talk about when we talk about that, even in a, even with, with a lot of returns where I've seen where let's say the preparer maybe didn't do the 5471 correctly, but they knew one needed to be done. You know what they almost always miss is the 926. 
Yeah, that's a that's an ungotten form. That that's a great point actually, because a lot of times people are not paying any attention to how much has been contributed. One of the the really big things, I mean, I see that there's this sort of big problem that there's a lot of these companies out there that are doing tremendous marketing, right? Like they're pumping out a lot of blogs every month. They're pumping out videos, Google marketing and Facebook marketing and charging relatively low fees compared to what they should be for somebody who really knows what what they're doing, right? But they're sort of getting the business because they have the visibility through their marketing and because of the, the, you know, I mean, the amount of their content that they put out, I mean, a, a lot of it, you know, if you're not a tax professional at the surface, it looks like they, they know what they're doing, right? But but it's not the nuance. And then it seems to me like a lot of the guys that really know what they're what they're doing, you know, they don't have time to put out all this content, right? Like, like they're working. And so some of the sort of things that that I've noticed, one, if somebody's charging any kind of flat fee, then probably this isn't who you want to go with because returns are sort of a rabbit hole. You never know where they're going to go. I, I feel like that's a red flag. I, I also think that what's really important is you need to look at, I mean, obviously the person's credentials, right? Like what's their education? What's their experience? Do they have any professional licenses? I would almost go so far as to say, you know, the professional license is almost a little bit less important sometimes than I think than the experience, right? Because if you have a CPA that's been doing auditing for five years and now he's saying I'm doing international tax, like, you know, it's not really going to be that beneficial. I mean, I think it's a combination of the both, the professional license, even education to, to a lesser extent, right? I mean, it really comes down to the experience, right? Where they've worked, are these reputable firms. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, a lot of these guys come out of big fours, global mobility department and Look, you know, and, and, and that can go both ways. Um, the way Big Four sort of operates now in, in India, right? You've got, you've got this massive global mobility department that does nothing but, what, 1040s and foreign earned income exclusions, maybe some FBAR, some foreign tax credit. Anything complex, they have a different team that handles it. I don't know how much of that work is done in India, but in, in my experience with some of these firms, that are really good at marketing, that have hundreds of employees in India and Philippines, wherever else, and they're pumping out returns for you know, streamlines for $3,500. Like that, that's that's six years of FBARs and three years of returns. I I don't know how much they're involved in the day-to-day. They, they seem to be a marketing person, you know, sort of a, a head figure, but all of their returns are just being done at a very low level. I, I know I had a couple of people that came from these firms and they had told me, you know, similar to what your experience was that, hey, we were assigned this many hundred returns and we just had to complete it. There was no guidelines on what the positions were. You know, there was no budgets. Uh, we didn't know. We didn't have anybody really to talk to about these returns. We had tax slips and we were sort of putting them in tax return. That is, it's mostly data entry. You don't have staff at that level that can really look at a client situation and understand it and analyze it to see what may make sense here, whether there's an election that they could benefit from, analyze something that may not have been present in the prior year return. You know, what they're sort of doing is just copying what was done in the previous year and rolling with it. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the other ones is also sort of a, it's called a good rule of thumb, right? Is 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 whatever company you're potentially interviewing to to do your return, right? Let's say they quote you a flat fee, right? Is to ask them, how many hours do you think it's going to take you to replete, complete this return, right? And then take the fee, divide it by the hours. If it comes out to like less than 350 bucks an hour or something like that. This probably does there's probably a no-go. That's probably not who you want to be doing business with. Right. No, that that's that's right. Because you know, we've internally we've done a lot of um surveys throughout the US on what CPA firms sort of average out. And and that's exactly it. It's between three hundred and three fifty an hour yeah. for a reputable firm. Now, when you factor an international tax, you know, the fees tend to be on the higher side. But, but you're exactly right. That's it. One other thing people can do, right? Like, I mean, I, 
I mean, it's been a long time since I've looked at it, right? But I mean, if you look at like the instructions to most of these international tax forms, they sort of give you an estimated number of hours that you need to allocate to this form. So right. if you take 350 and multiply it times whatever that number is, if whatever they're quoting you is significantly less, then yeah, it's a probably a pr- pretty good indication that well, these aren't the people you want to be doing business with. I agree. That, that's a good point. I think a lot of times people rely on like these blogs and I mean, look, I have a YouTube channel and, and a podcast, but you know, I think a lot of people rely on, on, on YouTube and blogs as if like this is gospel, right? That like everybody that's publishing this stuff knows what they're doing when that's not the case, right? I mean, that's not been vetted at all. That's just whatever this person is saying. You know, what's really important also to look at is where have these people been published, right? Have they been quoted right. in any major media outlets? Have they been published in a professional journal or, or, or anything like that? I, mean, I think that's much more important than, oh, this guy pumps out five blogs a week. For example, I know you, you write for Bloomberg quite a bit. You know, I've been published in Bloomberg a couple of times and that's that's really key because that's, you know, sort of what professionals use. You know, we're not we're not on Google as much as we'd like to just quickly search something. Yep. We're not on Google or YouTube learning this stuff. That that's more for educating others. What other sort of tips would you have or, or indications that somebody knows what they're doing or not or doesn't know what they're doing w- would you have if you were a potential clients like, hey, these are my tips for choosing a tax repair. These are maybe some things that you should look for, some things that are red flags that you don't want to use these person. I always find it interesting that when we're picking up a new client, I always ask them why they're leaving their prior prepare. You know, how are they referred to us? Why are they interested in becoming our client? And sort of interviewing the client, it, it may seem odd that we're interviewing the client, but I think it's, it's an indication of a good firm that you don't just accept anybody that calls you or emails you. You, you, you sort of find the right fit. And we're not volume-based, right? Uh, you know, we, we have a hundred some employees, but we're, we're fairly busy. We don't have the time to market, like you said, you know, even though we like to, you know, we, we try to get a newsletter out once a month. You know, a lot of these firms are publishing on a, on a daily basis. Um, I, I also think it's key that you interview the tax team that you're working with, not just that partner. You know, another point that you made on the flat fee versus the hourly billing, I know people don't like hourly billing, but this is tax. We don't know how long something takes, right? If, if we're changing a light bulb, we, we know that this will take 10 minutes. We can work off of a flat fee, but tax, especially internationally, you can, you can get into a file and it just unravels because a client doesn't know what they have. That's why they're choosing us. So one, I really like what you said about interviewing the clients and not just taking on anybody as a client. I 100% agree with you. I think that that is a very indi- good indication of a good firm, that they take a minute to understand your situation, make sure you're a good fit for one or, one another, rather than just saying, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll take this on, we can do it without even knowing what it is that you have to do. But the other point that you made that I really like is about interviewing the tax team. Because it's not just about understanding the partner that you're working with, but you also want to know who's actually going to be doing the data entry, who's going to be doing the client relations. And I think part of that is also understanding from the partner, like, how many returns are, are, are you reviewing in a tax season, right? Like, and, right. and then kind of thinking through, like, is that a reasonable amount to where they're going to be able to, to do a good job reviewing it? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. One of the other things that I've thought about a, a lot is, you know, when when you look at these companies that are really doing volume-based business with low fees, I don't think I've ever seen a return prepared by one of these firms that hasn't had a mistake. How do these guys do it with malpractice insurance? Like, do, do they have insurance or are they just hoping for the best? You know, I would suspect they probably don't have insurance. Uh, they, they're, they're operating out of jurisdictions where most People, I don't think, would chase them, you know, or or, or, or bring suit to them. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good observation. It it all comes down to getting comfortable with with the right tax team, not just uh, going off of what the lowest fee is. There's a good chance that if you're interviewing three or four firms, you probably don't want to go with the lowest. I'm not saying that you always go with the highest either, but 
it's uh you know if if somebody's coming in super low that there's a reason for that you know a lot of times when we bid on work and if somebody comes back to me and says you know actually at this case a couple of weeks ago we had a streamline and you know we were at was was a lot of work and our fees were a bit high on that and a client came back to me and said well you know i got a quote from this person in new zealand and uh they're doing it for one tenth of what your fee is i said well i don't <laughs> you know i don't think we have a conversation here uh we we ended up doing the work obviously uh because i think that the client was smart enough to understand that there's a reason for it uh but you know it, it dealt with a new zealand kiwi saber that this other firm had no idea although they were practicing in new zealand I think when it comes to to this type of work like you know you never go to the cheapest doctor right you, you never hear you never hear anybody say who's the cheapest doctor for this right the questions is always who's the best and i'm always surprised that people take that approach with with tax work especially international tax work i mean given the ramifications the, the penalties are astronomical some of the 35 20 penalties are like five percent of the unreported amount like 5471s could be like 10 grand a month fbar right. penalties could be 50 percent of the amount of the account yeah. and the worst part that i think most people don't recognize is if you don't file the forms or you do them substantially wrong there's no statute of limitations if you forget to file a PFIC or if you don't complete the PFIC form correctly, even on the 5471, I've seen penalties assessed when it's substantially incomplete. And I guess by definition, you could have a substantially incomplete form if you just submit reporting on page one, the percentage that somebody owns. It's, you know, the, the, the rules are absurd, the penalties are high, and people have to be careful. You know, at least with doctors, you know that all doctors for the most part are held to some sort of a standard you know if you're going to go to a physician you, you sort of know what you're getting you know good or bad with a cpa to your point earlier you could have a cpa that has the audit experience and the financial experience that's never seen a tax return um, yep. you just don't know what you get so the credentials i i don't put a lot of weight into it it's one of the things i mean look i obviously think that it's good that somebody has a credential right but I, I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people miss is I think that a lot of times when people think CPA, they think tax, right? And I, I think as far as I understand, you know, the education and what is on the CPA exam, I mean, I'm not a CPA, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, is more heavily on accounting and audit and stuff like this than it is on on, on tax. Not that tax isn't in there, but it, not as heavy on tax as it is on other things. And that if you're a CPA that wants to, do tax work, the knowledge and expertise in order to do that, especially international tax, comes from experience. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you as, as always. I appreciate your, your insights. Uh, I'll make sure to put your contact information in the description. So in case anybody needs an international tax expert that really knows what they're doing to get their returns done, that they can reach out to you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.